Um, we're blessed to be here, uh, to be with you and to, to worship and just be part of what God's doing um, in, uh, in the fellowship here at Coastline Calvary and in the community. It's a, it's a blessing to be part of that. So I'm going to ask if you would open your Bible up to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And uh, we are going to actually um, look at a scene that we most often look at during the Christmas season. And so if you feel like this Christmas went past and you didn't get what you were hoping for, we're, we're revisiting Christmas and maybe this morning you'll get the gift that you were hoping for. So Luke chapter 1 at verse uh, 26 and following. And <clears throat> um, what, what's going to happen in this passage is Mary is going to be confronted with, uh, with what I call the impossible promises of God. That is to say, God is going to promise something to Mary. Mary is going to measure herself up against that promise, and she is going to determine that that promise is impossible, that there's no possible way for that promise to ever be accomplished in her life. And, and as a result of that, I think that Mary's story in a lot of ways is our story. We are confronted with these, these promises that God gives to us about the things that he wants to do in our lives and the things that he wants to do through our lives. And we measure ourselves up against those promises or those promises maybe against ourselves, and we determine, I, I don't think that's possible. I think it's impossible for that to ever be worked out in my life. Let, let, me, let me try to illustrate. Um, the, our, our relationship with God, Christianity, the message of the cross, it is, is premised upon this idea of the new birth. In other words, the Bible teaches that when you look at the cross and that you see yourself as a sinner and you see Christ as the Savior and you put trust in Christ, not only are you stepping into a new lifestyle and not only are you being promised eternal life, but the Bible tells you that, that, that actually the Spirit of God enters inside of you. And the Bible uses terms like you are regenerated, or the Bible says that you are born again, or the Bible says that you become a new creation in Christ. And, and the, the reason for that is the Bible says that the very Spirit of God, the same Spirit that hovered over the face of the deep, the same Spirit that, that resided upon the tabernacle and later the temple and filled it with the radiant glory of God, that same Spirit of God enters inside of you. That's what the Bible says happened the moment you believed. So, you, you know, however it looked for you, whatever your story was, maybe you're in the process even this morning of considering that and of making a decision for Christ. But whatever it looked like for you, you were wrestling with the message and you made that decision and you prayed to invite Jesus into your life and this incredible thing happened where the Spirit of God entered into you and you were born again and you became a new creature in Christ. Now, the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel foretold these events. They spoke to, a, to a, a people who lived in a relationship with God that was based upon um, attempts to keep outward ordinances. And they promised a time when they said that there would be a new covenant that God would write. And he would write that covenant actually not on tablets of stone, but actually on the tablet of our heart. And they talked about how then the Spirit of God would enter us and we would begin to be transformed from the inside out. Jesus talked about this experience, and he referred to it as being like drinking living water that would produce like a well inside of you, and this living water would flow out of you onto the lives of others around you. Um, Paul spoke about this experience, and he talked about how when it happens, it's like the love of God begins to shed abroad in your heart. I used an illustration first service, and I'm not smart enough to not use it this service. Um, but when I was, um, when I was a, a teenager, early teenager, um, there was this incredible invention that was, that was uh, made available to the general public called a microwave oven. And um, I re I'd heard stories about these things. And, and I actually had a friend whose family had one. And so... 
we were over at his house one day and we, we got the idea, I wonder what would happen if we put various things in the microwave. So we you know, did it with some different stuff and then we got an egg and we put the egg in the microwave and we turned the knob. So if some of you can remember, hopefully you still don't have it, but you turn the knob and it go tick, 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 and the light comes on and so the microwaves are beating down upon this egg and the molecules begin to speed up and the egg starts shaking and shaking and shaking and all of a sudden just explodes all over the inside of the oven. We're like, wow, get another one. And so we literally, we, we went through a dozen of his mom's eggs inside. And there was, there was egg everywhere inside that microwave. I mean, it, it, the whole inside of it covered an egg. And the reason I'm telling you that, because I can't read where Paul writes in Romans 5 about the spirit of God entering us and the love of God shed abroad in our hearts without thinking of the egg in the microwave. And I wanted to torture you in the same way that I've been tortured. So, but you get the idea. This love, Paul says, will explode within us. And Jesus told us that this love would express itself in various ways, that we would have a love for God. And that love for God would be like, I, I just love God. I, I want to do what pleases him. I, in my private life, I'm, I make decisions about what I'll do and not do when no one else is looking because I love God and I want to do what's pleasing to him. And in my, my family life, my relationship with my, my wife and my children and my grandchildren, I just, I want to please God because this love is affecting how I view my neighbor, my closest neighbors and my extended neighbors. And, and Jesus went so far as to say this would even affect the way that I view and treat those people who he called my enemies. An enemy would be someone who has a value system that opposes my value system and threatens my value system. And Jesus said that I would have a love for them. And then Paul wrote, later Paul talked about this work of the Spirit in our life, and he talked about how my life would be guarded with a peace that comes from God. So that when I'm facing the situations in life, instead of being filled with anxiety or fret or worry or fear, that there's this peace that just guards me. Now, you might look at yourself, you hear those promises, you go, wait a minute, a, a transformation that works from within and living water that flows out of me and affects people around me? and love for God, and for my neighbors close and far, and love even for those that are opposed to me, and, and, and quiet rest and assurance in the midst of pandemonium, and you go, I'm not sure that describes my life. Your life might be marked right now by, by anxiety or fret or worry. You, you might be a person where you're, you're so agitated by the world around us and, and, and everything you hear that's going on in the world, you just get upset and you get angry and you get frustrated and you're going, I'm sorry, but this whole peace of God thing is not really working for me. You, do you understand what I'm saying? That our experience in our attempts to follow Jesus is we are met by these promises that God, of things that God wants to do in our life and through our life and in many ways we feel like, I'm not sure if that's actually possible in my life. I'm not sure about it. Well, I think Mary's story is a story of a person who's met with impossible promises. She gauges those promises based upon who she is. She questions how it can be possible and God provides a solution. So let's look at, at her story. It starts in verse 26 of Luke chapter one. It reads this way. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a, what? A virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the, what? Virgin's name was Mary. So let me ask you, do, in, in our text, we're introduced to this woman, Mary. Um, do we know her hair color? Do we know what color her eyes were? Do we know how old she is? Do we know if she has siblings? Do we, like those are some, you know, probably in, interesting things we'd like to know. But what's the one thing we know about this woman? What's the one thing we're told? She's a virgin. And how often are we told it? Twice. It's important to the narrative, isn't it? It's very important to Luke that we understand one thing about this lady. <laughs> There's a lot of things we'd love to know. 
that we just don't get told. But it's very important to Luke that we understand this one thing. Mary is a virgin. She's never had sexual relations with any man. That's who she is. That's how she's introduced. Let's keep reading. We read, And having come in, verse 28, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Let me read that to you one more time. Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Verse 29, but when she saw him, she was troubled at his, what? Saying. So she sees an angel. Is she troubled by seeing an angel? Look carefully. Is she troubled by seeing an angel? No, she's not troubled by seeing an angel. Let me tell you, I think I would be. I, I, have, I have no interest in meeting an angel this side of heaven. I think it'll be great when I get into eternity to be like, oh, awesome. But until then, I have no interest. I read my Bible, I see these characters described, and I'm like, I'm pretty cool. Not going through life ever seeing one. If for no other reason, then could you imagine if I met one this morning on Pensacola Beach, and then I came in here and told you about it? And you'd be thinking, this guy's crazy. So for no other reason than you wouldn't believe me, I have no interest. But she, she sees this angelic being, and she's not necessarily troubled by it. She's troubled by what? What he said. What he said to her. What did he say to her? You're highly favored. God's with you. You're blessed among women. God, look, God or the angel looks at her and says, listen, Mary, God thinks about you. God knows who you are. God has, God has a plan for you to participate in his, his desire to reach humanity or to redeem humanity. Mary, you're going to play an intricate role in this. That's what the angel says. You're highly favored by God. And she's troubled by that. And I, and I think there's probably a lot of reasons why that would trouble her. Mary is a young woman living in an obscure little village um, in a nation that's being occupied by Rome and really being taken over by Rome. They're, they're a people group who had become very discouraged and lost sight of many of the hopes and promises that God had given him in his word simply because of the circumstances that they were living under. And, and here's Mary in those circumstances. I think it's, it's, it's reasonable why she would think, I'm not sure I'm highly favored. I'm not sure God has a plan for my life. I'm not sure God can use me in any way. And I think we often feel that way. It's interesting, this phrase, highly favored, it's a translation of a compound Greek word that carries the idea of, of, of God. He, he looks at us lovingly and he pursues us with his grace. That's kind of what the, the concept of the word is. Um, and this word is only used two times in the Bible. It's used once here where the angel looks at Mary and says, God highly favors you, Mary. And Mary's troubled by that. The other time that it's used is in um, the book of Ephesians. And in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is, is describing what is true of every person who has put their trust in Jesus Christ. And he begins to list what he calls spiritual blessings. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And so these are the things that are true of you if you're a child of God. And when he comes to the sixth verse of Ephesians chapter 1, he says this. He says, God has made us, the child of God, those who have put faith in him, has made us accepted in the beloved. That phrase, accepted in the beloved, is the exact same Greek term translated highly favored here. Here's the idea. God looks at Mary. God says, I love you. I think of you. I have a plan for you to participate in the work that I'm doing in the world. And God looks at every one of us. And he says, I love you. I think about you. I have a plan for you to participate in the work that I'm doing. And what was Mary's response? How, how did she respond to this? She was troubled. This word troubled, the root word is a word that's used quite often in the Bible. Unfortunately, biblical characters often face troubling circumstances. It's a word that means to be filled with fret and anxiety. 
um, but it's, it has a prefix in it, and the, the word with its prefix is only used here. And it's a word that means that fret and anxiety went all the way through Mary. Like this hit her to the core. And I think sometimes we feel that same way. God, I'm, what, you promised God to love me and have a plan for my life. And, you know, I'm just not sure. I know me. I don't know how, God, you could use me. So that's the first encounter that Mary has. She hears from the angel. She's troubled by him. Now, if the first part of her encounter with the angel troubled her, the next part of her encounter absolutely undoes her. Because listen to what the, what the angel says. We're going to pick up at verse uh, 30. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Verse 31. And behold, you will what? Conceive. Conceive. What, what are the only two things we learned about Mary? Or only one thing we learned about Mary? We heard it twice. She's a virgin. And what does the angel say? You're going to conceive. You're going to conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. Listen, you're going to have a son. You'll call him Jesus. He will be great. He will be, he will be the son of the highest. He'll sit upon the throne of David, and he'll rule over a kingdom that has no end. That's quite a promise, isn't it? Do, you know, if, if, uh, if you have small children, do you have expectations for your children? You look at him, you go, oh, man. You look at him, you go, my... My son started crawling at four months, right? Oh, my friend's son didn't start crawling till they were six months. Oh, my son's so smart. Or look at him. He, he mispronounces words better than all the other 18-month-year-olds. He's like the smart, like, right? We have these expectations of our children. We, we project on them all these grand things that we hope are going to be true of their life. Imagine an angel comes to you and says, you're going to have a child. And this child is going to be the long-awaited savior of humanity. And this child is going to be a king. And this child is going to sit upon a th the throne of a kingdom that will never end. Oh, right? But listen to how Mary responds. She ignores all of that. And listen to how she responds. Verse 34, Mary said, how can this be because I don't know a man? She only responded to one part of the promise. The angel said, you're going to conceive and have a child. And I don't, it's possible she didn't hear a word he said after that, right? <laughs> Wait, that's impossible. I'm a virgin. I've never known a man. He comes with this promise that, that Mary looks at herself and looks at the promise and says, that's not even possible. I want to suggest to you that the angel knew that the message was impossible. Look down at verse 37. The angel says, for with God, nothing is what? Impossible. He knows. He goes, yeah, I know. It's not possible. But God's in the equation. So here's Mary. She, and, and that's why I said, in some ways, Mary's story is our story. She's confronted with a promise. She looks at herself and it's like, I'm sorry, there's no way that can happen. Um, Mary's story is, is unique. I think we could give her that. Um, we often feel like our circumstances are unique. We often feel like we're, we're going through a particular difficulty and we feel like no one can relate to what we're going through. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to diminish the challenge that you might be facing, um, but I do want to suggest to you that on a planet with 8 billion people, I would suggest that there are literally millions of people that can experience or experience what you're going through. If you're, going, if you're suffering from loss or you're suffer, suffering from something that's filled you with dread or anxiety, you're suffering challenge of, of, of broken interpersonal relationships, I know that it can feel as though we're alone in this thing, but there are literally millions of people that can relate to what you're going through. Do you think that's true in Mary's case? Is that, is that true in Mary? How many, since the time of Mary backwards... How many virgins conceived and gave birth? How many? Zero. And since Mary moving forward, how many virgins have conceived and given birth? None. She is literally the only person to ever go through this trial. Okay, God, when God created the, the human beings, he, he created the male and the female of the species. And it's necessary for reproduction to happen, it's necessary for both the male and the female to participate. 
and all of the, the science that we have of the creative ways for that to happen, it's still absolutely necessary for both the male and the female of the species to participate. Does that make sense? This is an impossibility. And so one thing we could do, and, and I think we sometimes inadvertently project this into our reading of the Bible, is sometimes we think, well, that's awesome for Mary, but I'm not Mary. So the solution that God gives might not be true for me too. I want to suggest that's not the case. Let's look at the solution and let's examine it a little bit. Um, the response to the angel, uh, from the angel, Mary says, how, verse 35, the angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the one who is born of you will be called the Son of God. What does the angel think the solution to her problem is? What is the, well, let's read it again and see if we can find that. That's going to be the test question. What does the angel think is the solution to her problem? Look, look at verse 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One that is born to you will be called the Son of God. What does the angel think the solution is? The Spirit of God coming upon her, right? That's the problem. Here's your problem. It's a, it's a real problem. You actually are facing an impossibility. There is no way for, naturally speaking, for the virgin to conceive and have a child. It's impossible. But the impossibility is met by the Spirit of God comes upon you and the power of the highest overshadows you. And the result is what God promised will actually be accomplished. And I want to suggest to you that, that throughout Scripture and in our own personal experience, that whatever the challenge is that we're facing, whatever the problem is, we've got the promise of God, we size that promise up against who we are and what our limitations are, and we think there's no way this could happen, that the answer that God has to that is, listen, the Spirit of God will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you and my promise will be worked out in you. That's God's method. The, this, this, this term, the power of God, the Spirit of God come upon you, the power of God will overshadow you. The power of God, it's, it's that um, Greek word dunamis. So if you've been a Christian for you know, more than a few months, you've probably heard that word. Um, it's, it is a very, very common Greek word. It has an application. It could be used to describe all sorts of different types of power. It's not something that is um, restricted only to speak of God's power. However, in Scripture, we, th we, we see things like the creative ability of God being attributed to his dunamis power. So God speaking the world out of nothing into existence. And the writers of Scripture say, well, he was able to do that because of his dunamis or his power. We see God interrupt the laws that he's put in place to keep the universe functioning. We see him do things like stand on water or, or multiply uh, bread and fish or, or you know, part seas. And, and those miraculous things that God does are attributed to his dunamis power. That's how it's explained. How did God do this? What's his power? And then things where, where God, uh, perhaps the most powerful thing ever demonstrated in human history, when God raised Christ from the dead. That wasn't just a miracle. It wasn't like the raising of Lazarus was a miracle. It was God interrupting the laws that he's put in place to govern the universe and a man that's been dead for four days, his body's decaying and life is spoken back into this man and he resuscitates. That's the mir miraculous power of God. But raising Jesus from the dead is an entirely different thing. Jesus raised into a new and glorified body after conquering sin and death and hell and redeeming all of humanity back to God. That's the most powerful event in human history. And it's attributed to dunamis. The writers of Scripture say, well, God was able to do that because of his power. And so here's what the angel tells Mary. Mary, you're facing the impossibility. And from your standpoint, it might be impossible. But here's what's going to happen. The Spirit of God comes upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. This phrase overshadow, it's a word that speaks of, of like, a, like if, if a, if a you know, fog bank comes in and you kind of get covered in the fog bank. I don't know, I, 
I've, I've been three times now to Gulf Breeze. Um, I was here the day after a hurricane. I was here the day after your church flooded because you had hail and crazy rain. And then I've been here when I think I landed in Pittsburgh. It's freezing yesterday, right? And so, so, but I don't know like how the climate works. I don't know if you guys get that thick fog here. Um, where I grew up in Southern California, we would, we would get that. And sometimes you could, you could see the fog coming towards you. So I go down to the beach early in the morning and you'd look out on the, on the ocean. In Southern California where I grew up, there's this marine layer that kind of sits on the coast. And so it's, it's pretty ugly um, most, of the, uh, most of the early summer, June, July, and August. Um, so the beaches in, in Orange County, um, it's gloomy and cold and ugly until about noon because this, this marine layer. Periodically, more commonly in the winter months, you could see sometimes this wall out in the ocean, and it's this fog bank, and it's something you just see it coming, and it's like, oh, bummer. And it just comes in, and the fog would get so thick that you, know, you couldn't see three, four feet in front of you. Completely lost. Like, I, wouldn't, I would not be able to see the front row be so thick with fog. And, and I'm still there, but the fog bank covers me. Does that make sense? So here's what he's saying. This power that's God's, it's going to overshadow you, Mary. It's not going to take over you, Mary. You're not going to be like, I can't, I can't control myself. <laughs> like, that's not the power of God. Any, just quickly, this is a free parenthetical phrase. Anytime you see somebody losing control of themselves and blaming the Spirit of God, that's not how the Spirit of God works. It says the Spirit of God is going to overshadow you. And in, as we read the story, Mary's still Mary. Mary's going to have to walk out of that. She's got this promise from God. Is there, is there immediate evidence of this promise? I mean, I've never been pregnant, so I'm going to lean on some of the ladies in the room, but I'm pretty sure there's not immediate evidence. She couldn't go to Walgreens and get a, get a quick test and, look, it's blue. Is blue the color? I don't know. Like, sorry, I'm a little distant from this. But um, you get the idea. Like, like, but over, a, over several months, things are going to change in Mary. Mary's going to be Mary. And we read the birth story. That's a challenging story. This woman traveling from the north of Israel down to the south and ending up in some stable or cave or something, giving birth to a child in the middle of the night. And some lunatic man writes a story about silent night and holy night. And the baby didn't cry. It's like, yeah, you weren't there. But, the, but you, you get the idea. This, this Mary's still Mary. The power of God is going to accomplish through Mary what he wants to accomplish. She's not told to do anything. And this is the same storyline throughout the Bible. Moses, Moses, you're gonna deliver two million people out of a slavery that they've been under for 400 years. How, God? Well, I'm gonna be with you and I'm gonna empower you. In fact, I'm gonna take that stick that's in your hand and I'm gonna make it the most powerful weapon that the world's ever seen. It's gonna part seas and bring water out of rock. It'll turn into snakes. It'll eat other snakes. I mean. I'm just going to empower that. And the story of the Bible is, is individuals faced with these promises. Jeremiah, Jeremiah encounters the Lord. God says, Jeremiah, I'm going to make you a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah goes, um, I have a little problem with that, God. Like, I'm a teenager, and I really don't know any world leaders. I'm not sure about this. And God's promise is going to be accomplished through his spirit. And so the solution that's given to Mary, the, the, her problem is unique. You're never going to have that problem. You, but her, the solution to her is always the solution. The spirit of God, of God will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, we'll wrap this up, is how do we experience that? How do we experience this spirit of God? And how do we experience this power that will overshadow us or, or, or accomplish in us the things that God promises how do we experience that? Um, the prophet Joel spoke prophetically about the coming spirit. He, he spoke to a people group who had read stories of the spirit of God coming upon individuals for prescribed period of time and for specific events. And Joel made this promise. He said, now a time's coming when the spirit of God is going to be made available to all people. And it, the Spirit of God will come upon old 
and young, rich and poor, slave and free, male and, women, and female. And the Spirit of God, with the Spirit of God, will, will come these demonstrations of the Spirit. Joel talked about them. Paul uh, um, ex expounded upon what they are. But he says, the Spirit of God will come upon you. In Acts chapter 2, we read of an event where that happens. We have a group of believers in a room. They're waiting upon God. And suddenly the Spirit of God comes upon them and there's demonstration, evidence that God's Spirit is coming upon them. And Peter, when he explains the event, refers back to Joel's prophecy. This is what Joel promised. The Spirit of God available to all, rich, poor, male, female, slave, free, old and young. The Spirit of God coming upon you and evidences of the Spirit coming upon us. Now Jesus talked to us about Okay, that Joel has given us that promise, but how do I experience? Jesus told a story, it's in Luke chapter 11. He told a story about a man who had a visitor come over in the middle of the night, and this man had no food at his house. So he went to his neighbor's house and knocked on the door. And his neighbor said, get out of here, it's midnight. And he kept knocking. He kept knocking until his neighbor got up and brought him some food. And the context, Jesus is saying, that's how you pray. You don't pray one time, oh, Lord, if you want to. He says, be persistent in prayer. And then Jesus said this, ask and seek and knock. And he said, for example, if a father, or I'm sorry, if a son asked his father for bread, would the father give him a stone? And if he asked for a fish, would a father give him a snake? And if he asked for an egg, would a father give him a scorpion? <laughs> Imagine being in the audience when Jesus is giving these illustrations. You're like, that's crazy. And then Jesus says, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Right? Asking for God to fill you with his Spirit. Now, the whole context of that, Jesus is not inviting us to a one-time experience with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's not to negate the fact that we might have a one-time experience with the this, with this Spirit that is quite dramatic. Jesus is inviting us to a lifestyle of experiencing the work of the Spirit. Because of how often does a child ask their parents for food? Is that a one-time encounter? Yeah, I can remember back, I think it was 2003, I think one of the boys came up and asked you for lunch, right, Chris? It's a daily occurrence, it's multiple times a day. And I think what Jesus is inviting us to is, is, listen, I'm inviting you to a lifestyle where you recognize your need for the work of the Spirit of God in your life, but you also recognize the willingness of God to meet you in that need. That's a beautiful way to live your Christianity. It's a beautiful way to live your Christianity. You look and go, Lord, I, I just read in your word and you're asking me to forgive this person and Lord, I don't know if I can forgive them. I, I don't know if I can possibly do that. But I know, Lord, that I can receive from your spirit what I lack in myself. And so God, would you give me that? Lord, you're asking, they're looking for people to, to participate in this area of ministry and I don't know if I'm qualified for that. But Lord, I believe that if you're calling me to this, you'll equip me for that, and I can walk in this lifestyle where I recognize my dependence upon the Spirit, but I also recognize God's willingness to provide His Spirit. That's really the story. You read through the book of Acts. That's their story. They get filled with the Spirit on one occasion, and multiple times after, refilled with the Spirit every challenge that they're facing. Father, we are so thankful for... The fact that, first of all, you know us, that we are highly favored. Lord, that when you look in this room and you look into our lives, Lord, you know our names, you know the, the struggles that we face, you know the objections that we would have to anything you might want to do in our life, and yet you still have a plan and a purpose for us. And so, Father, we want to ask for a fresh work of your Spirit in our lives. And Lord, not just, a, not just something that we could mark this day as, as a day where something happened, but more so that we mark this day as a day where moving forward, we live recognizing our dependence upon you and your willingness to meet us in our dependence. So Lord, would your spirit come upon us? Would your power overshadow us for your kingdom 
and for your glory until you come. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.